Well, I always say that there were just the five of us. Just the five of us, including my grandmother, who was hearing. Little is known of deaf Jewish people's experiences under Hitler's reign of terror. Few deaf Jews lived to tell, and even fewer chose to share. This is the story of the Weiner Ratner family and how they were able to flee the persecution of Nazism to live at the foot of the Mother of Exiles. Life for the Weiner family in Vienna, Austria was peaceful and prosperous. So then my grandparents had five children together, the first of whom was an uncle who was hearing, and then a second uncle was born who was also hearing. The third was my mother, whom they found to be deaf, and my grandmother had no idea how to cope with this. She was totally overwhelmed and didn't know what to do. Anyway, a fourth child was born who was also deaf, and my grandmother seemed to calm down a little bit at the birth of this fourth child. And of course, my mother was overjoyed because she'd finally have somebody to communicate with. And they were very close, these two deaf siblings. And my grandmother decided she wanted to have more children. This is what she always said, but she was concerned. She wanted to have more children, but she certainly didn't want to have any more deaf children. So she went to a doctor and he suggested that my grandparents wait eight or nine years until they tried to become pregnant again. They did indeed wait the eight years, and then a fifth child, my hearing aunt, was born. Vienna, Austria was considered to be one of the most cultured cities in Europe at the time. Austria boasted several deaf schools, and Vienna itself was home to a very vibrant deaf community. Prior to the advent of Nazism and anti-Semitism, Deaf Jews and Gentiles mixed freely and held key leadership positions. It was through these deaf associations and events that Isidore Ratner, also a deaf Jew, met and wooed Hilda Weiner. My father was deaf, and he was born in Poland. He didn't exactly tell my mother the truth about where he was born. Now, my mother has her side of the story. She feels very strongly that he lied to her and that he changed his birth certificate to say he was born someplace else. They married, and it seems that from the beginning of their marriage, she had less trust in him than before as a result of this lie. When my sister was born, my father sort of tested her to see if she was deaf, and of course he found out by rattling pans and what have you that she was deaf. And he was depressed by this. It seemed to have really hit him hard. I asked my mother, why was he so upset about that? She said, well, that's him. He wanted hearing children. He wanted somebody to help him communicate, use the phone. Isidore and Hilda would have two more deaf children, a son who would die as a toddler, and Lily. So I came along, and I was found to be deaf, and that basically was the beginning of the dissolution of the marriage. They separated after that, and they never officially filed for divorce because when the Nazi occupation happened, one of the several edicts that were issued was that Jews could not apply for divorce. So they never were officially divorced. Matilde, the hearing grandmother, and her two deaf adult children, Hilda and Richard, lived together with Hilda's two deaf daughters, Nellie and Lily. My mother had worked as a seamstress, and my uncle was quite an accomplished tailor. What they decided to do was start sort of a cottage industry, a home business during the wartime. And my mother helped out with all the sewing and all the details of what my uncle's business would be. And this is a business they ran out of our home. And we all lived together. When the Nazi occupation happened and when Germany invaded Austria, everything changed overnight drastically. There were all these rules, regulations, edicts, I don't even know what they were called, but Jewish children 
no longer had permission to attend schools, so my education came to a halt in 1938, and until 1940, I didn't go to any school. So people often ask me, what did you do? You just stayed home? I remember just staying home. That's it. My mother protected us and didn't even let us out of the house. My mother could go out and do the shopping, but I had no school for two years and was stuck at home. I think I turned out okay. I'm not simple-minded or anything. My mother told so many stories. We had a very rich communication environment at home. But my mother was the one person who was able to go out and do shopping or whatever she needed to do. At that time, there was only a two-hour window of opportunity every day to go shopping, and my mother would be stuck in these long queues. She'd come back and explain about how scared she'd been standing in the queues. You know, my mother didn't really look Jewish. You can tell from the pictures that her facial features didn't look Jewish, really, and she had blonde hair. So she would be in these queues worrying that somebody was going to realize that she was Jewish and mistreat her. And she would always tell us when she came home, I needed to get food for my children. I needed to think about getting milk for my children. Of course, we'd say, thank you, Mama. Thank you, Mama. She was always telling us about how scared she was. As the Nazis gained control over Austria, their abuses increased. And I remember my mother telling me that she saw people being tortured in the streets. Old Jews with long beards sometimes had them pulled by people. They were mocked. People were spat on. People had to wash the streets. On November 9, 1938, in revenge for the murder of a high-ranking Nazi official, Kristallnacht began. Known as the Night of Broken Glass, the Nazis went on a rampage, breaking Jewish storefronts, beating Jews in the street, burning synagogues, and arresting innocent people to be sent to camps. The night that they destroyed everything, they destroyed the temples too, as you know, and we had a temple right next door to us and it was burned to the ground. I remember this very clearly. I was able to look out the window and crane my neck and see it burn. My mother actually saw Hitler during one of the military parades. The army and everybody standing around in the crowds were making the Sieg Heil salute. But my mother said that seeing Hitler was the catalyst that made her realize she had to do something and we were gonna have to get out. We had to do something to get out of Austria. Fortunately, Emil, the second oldest hearing son in the family, had already emigrated to the United States prior to the annexation of Austria. He was able to supply the family with affidavits and other important documents. A Jewish agency was also offering assistance to get the family of four deaf people and one elderly hearing woman out of Austria before the gate closed. For their passports, Jewish people were photographed in profile in the Nazis' effort to document racial characteristics such as ear and nose size for identification. Jewish women were all given the middle name of Sarah, and Jewish men were given the middle name of Israel. Now my area was in the process of becoming a ghetto, which means that all the Jewish people were being condensed into one particular area. Our area was called District 2. I believe it was District 2. Now, we lived in a fairly small place. I don't remember it, but I've seen pictures of the apartment, and if you looked at it, you realize it was a very small place to live. I really had no idea at the time because I was small, but it wasn't a really big building, and it's still there, actually. It's still standing. It didn't matter to the Nazis at all how much room you had. They moved the five of us into one of the rooms in our apartment. I remember we had all our beds in one room and we were so squeezed and crammed together. They had our beds, our sofa, our chairs, everything in one room. There was a kitchen down the hall, but all of our living arrangements had to be crammed into this one small room, which would then leave our other room available for another family to occupy, somebody we didn't even know. So one night my grandmother heard this pounding and the lights were flashing and she looked out the window and all the lights were flashing everywhere. Very, very noisy. And somebody was pounding on all the buildings and all the doors of our building. And she looked through the window and was just terrified because she saw that these raids were happening that night. And finally realized that they were gonna definitely be making one of these nocturnal visits to our home. The door was pounded and she opened it. 
and there were no questions that you could ask. They would just move you right out of the side and begin their inspection of your house willy-nilly. And I remember I took it all in stride because I didn't think anything of it. I didn't understand it. But my sister was a little girl who had sort of treasures and secrets. She had like a little compartment where she kept her junk, you know, her little trinkets and things that a little girl might have, her private effects. So she was guarding her treasures and she tried to hide them. I don't know why she did that, it just drew attention to it. But then the SS guy moved her out of the way and opened it and just found it was junk and it was no big deal. And my mother, her heart had been racing and her knees had been knocking and she was so scared. So they rifled through everything in the house and then an interesting thing occurred. One of the SS officer's eyes met my uncle's across the room. And he said, let me see your papers. And the papers indicated that we had been born in Vienna. But as for the other family, who was from Poland, they were deported immediately and sent to a concentration camp. He looked at my uncle's papers. We'd been born in Austria, thank God, because that's what saved us. And his eyes met my uncle's across the room, and there seemed to be some sort of important communication happening between the two of them, because then he said, that's all right, there's nothing here, let's go. We can leave now. So they took off, just from that communication that happened across the room between them. So as soon as they left, my mother asked my uncle, what's going on? And he said, well, we know each other. We used to work as tailors together. And now he's joined the Nazis. He's moved up in the world. I don't know. But it's strange when his whole affect changed as soon as he saw my uncle and he realized that he knew him. He knew he was deaf and he knew he'd worked with him before. He'd been mean. And then all of a sudden, he totally changed his affect. And then he took his cronies out the door and they left. And that really saved us. So during that time, my mother realized that we had to make plans about where to go. First choice was America, definitely. But if things didn't work out, maybe we could emigrate to England. Many people were emigrating to England at the time, becoming cooks or maids, cleaning houses, being domestics. And the two of us, my sister and I, could go to school, of course. That was her intention. But first and foremost, she wanted America. If America and England didn't work out, then she thought we could apply for asylum in Israel. So we got all the paperwork and everything was all set. And I'm remembering this because my mother explained it to me. She said that we needed to get my father to sign a release so that we would be able to go and leave Austria. And I have to forgive my mother in retrospect, but she lied to my father and told him we were going to England. So my father said, are you going to go to America? And my mother said, no, 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 no. We're not going to America. We're either going to go to England or Israel. I do remember that the time was approaching when we would be ready to leave and it was time to get my father to sign these consent papers. And so we met him halfway on the street somewhere. I remember this clearly. And my father came up to us and he was signing. And I was shy, I was hanging on to my mother's skirts, I was hiding, but my sister was more bold and she actually had a conversation with him. And my mother was cold and brusque and business-like during the whole encounter. And that was the last time I saw him. We finally got all the papers in order. My mother always said that God blessed our family. The time had finally come to leave and my mother said we had to leave now. And my grandmother said, no, I need to say goodbye to family and friends and goodbye to everything that I'm going to leave behind. But my mother was intractable and a large argument ensued between the two of them and with the result that my mother won, of course. And we left in the dead of night very quietly in April, 1940. It was very quiet, the streets were desolate, we took a taxi, I remember everything was so quiet. And we took off, that's how we left the city. We took a train. We had to go to the border of Austria and Italy. Now people who are historians say that the train we took was the last train that we could take out of Austria before the war broke out. And we were very lucky to be able to do that. My grandmother was so angry that she hadn't been able to say goodbye to her husband's grave. She wanted to go to the grave and give a farewell, but there was no time, and my mother made her hasten out of the country. And I remember clearly on the train ride, we passed by the graveyard, and my grandmother was sitting at the window looking out and praying towards the spot where my grandfather was buried. I remember that very well. When we got to the Italian border, and we were still on the Austrian side, the Gestapo was there waiting for us. 
and they would come in and perform inspections. And they would also confiscate everybody's money or their valuables because they didn't want anybody to go on and have any money or have any kind of possibility of a comfortable life in their future. We did have a few valuables, some gold earrings, rings, chains, and we sew them into the shoulder pads of our clothes. We stopped at the border, and one of the things I remember is that we waited and waited and waited at the border, and the train just wouldn't go. Finally, we moved on, and as we moved on, we saw that a lot of people who had actually disembarked from the train had come back, and some of them were going up to my grandmother saying, oh, you're so lucky, you're so lucky, you weren't taken out, you're very lucky. And my mother talked to her and said, what are they talking about? And we found out that when the Gestapo looked at the different passengers, if there was anything about you that looked the least bit suspicious, they would take you off the train and strip search you and confiscate whatever you had on your person. This didn't happen to us. Well, then we got to Italy, and there we were in Italy waiting for our ship to arrive. And we had to wait quite a while. My mother used to tell me that the boat we took was the last one that was available for us to take to America. And as soon as it arrived, we would embark upon it, and then that would be the last chance that anybody would have had. From Genoa, Italy, the family would board a ship called the Rex to take them to the United States. Later during the war, this very ship would be sunk in battle. It was an Italian liner, very beautiful. Of course, we were in third class down in steerage. But I remember looking around at it, and it was just a beautiful liner. Very pretty ship. I always say that God protected us and protected our family from harm on this journey because we were able to get on the boat and then we took off. And in the middle of the ocean, I became seasick, of course. We also celebrated Passover in the middle of our voyage. And we had a Seder on board the boat. Now finally we got to America, and I remember I was so excited that we were there. The sign that we used for America was produced by a hand patting the cheek, and the derivation from that sign came from the fact that back in World War I, when my mother was living in Austria, the American soldiers came and greeted people by patting them on the cheek. Some people think that actually the sign comes from the fact that American women wore so much makeup and rouge back in those days, but I think that either explanation is accurate. There we were, and my mother pointed out the Statue of Liberty. I sat at the railing looking up, and we were nervous but excited at the same time. I remember this very well. Finally, we docked, and we looked down at the throngs of people waiting on the pier. I remember wondering, where's my uncle? Is he among all these folks down on the pier waiting for us? People started to leave the boat, but we were left behind. There was so much paperwork and red tape that we had to get through. We started to become concerned as to why we weren't allowed off the boat. My grandmother was given permission to leave. She was hearing and there was no problem with her, but since we were deaf, we had to stay. But of course, my grandmother decided to stay with us. She had no intention of abandoning us, so she decided that she needed to protect us and she would stay behind. So there we were on the boat and we had to stay overnight. And I was so disappointed. There we were in New York, we couldn't get off this boat. My mother kept saying, I don't know why, I don't know why, we just have to wait, I'm not sure why. The next day, we were driven all over town so that we could catch the ferry. Now, where we docked was a pier. You know, I'm not exactly sure where it is. I haven't been able to find it. It's somewhere on the east side, the Italian area, I think. But then we had to go catch this ferry that would take us to Ellis Island. And there we stayed on Ellis Island for five months. Now, the reason we had to be there so long was because war had broken out. And the U.S. wasn't sure if they wanted to take in four deaf people to become welfare cases. Because the money was going to the war effort. They weren't sure they wanted to accept us. There were four of us who were deaf, and it just seemed like that was just a little too much for them to take in all at once. There was one woman who was a social worker. Her name was Mrs. Nash. She worked for the New York Society of the Deaf. She'd come over to Ellis Island quite frequently, and she was advocating for us. She was trying to convince them we could work. My uncle's a tailor. There's no problem with him being able to find gainful employment. My mother as well. Both of them would be able to work. And my sister and I would go to school, of course. We were so fortunate that we were able to get a guardian, somebody who decided to sort of sponsor us, you might say, and look after us. 
Simon E. Osterman was a well-to-do Jewish philanthropist in New York City who happened to have a deaf daughter, Beatrice Osterman Stern, and a deaf grandson, Jimmy Stern. Lily and Nellie would become friends of Jimmy at the Lexington School for the Deaf without realizing he was the grandson of their guardian, Mr. Osserman. Now, I didn't know anything about this connection until much, much later when I found out, and I was so surprised. I mean, small world. But anyway, it took five months for us to go through all of this. And if we hadn't done this, anywhere along this process, at any time, if the U.S. had decided not to accept us, we could have just been sent back. We would have been deported. I've heard a lot of stories about people who got this far in the process and then were kicked out. They were deported back to Europe. Our ship, the Rex, had stayed and then finally left to go back to Europe, and we could have easily been back on that if we hadn't been accepted into the U.S. The family gained admittance into the United States in time to celebrate Rosh Hashanah with relatives. They were able to find an apartment, work, and a school for the girls. Hilda and Richard, along with many other deaf immigrants, took English classes in the evening, which were taught by a deaf teacher from Gallaudet. Fred Fedred was a deaf Austrian survivor of the camps. And after the war, Fred made his way to the United States. As with many survivors, he looked up any deaf people he knew from Austria that were now living in New York City. At last, he found the Ratners. And he came and looked us up, and he said that, um, well, he was a little evasive at first. He said, what do you want to know? And we started mentioning different names of people that we knew to see if he knew what had befallen them. And he told my mother, your husband was in one of the deaf groups. And that news took my mother aback. She just couldn't say much to that statement. She was shocked about that. And he said, now, he was lucky because he and his parents had been in a group of people who didn't sign and draw attention to themselves. And in the separation process, they were sent to a labor camp because nobody knew they were deaf. But in that separation line where they called people, my father was taken out and sent to a gas chamber, and he was definitely sent to the gas chamber because he was in a group of deaf people who were signing and gesturing, and obviously the Nazis had no interest in maintaining deaf people or handicapped people in any way, shape, or form, and during that separation process, he was sent to the gas chamber. And he said it was a definite fact that he was one of them in that group and that he was gone. And he said there was no doubt about it. It breaks my heart when I think about it. When I became a U.S. citizen years later, I had to have proof of my parentage. And of course, I needed to find out about my father. And I need to find out some kind of proof or some sort of card or something that would have something about him. And the Red Cross gave me information that said he was last seen in Minsk. Now, I don't know what concentration camp was actually near Minsk, Minsk is located in a disputed territory between Poland and Russia. The ownership of this particular area goes back and forth between the two of them. The records were searched, but we never were able to find my father's name. We did find my grandmother's name, my father's mother, which was a thrill, but we were never able to find my father's name. Matilde, the maternal grandmother, moved to Israel to live with her hearing daughter. Richard, the deaf uncle, married a deaf survivor and raised a son. Hilda never remarried and raised her girls on her own, working to support them and paying off all debt incurred from their immigration to the United States. Hilda would reside in Tanya Towers, a nursing home for elderly deaf people in New York City. It was named after the social worker Tanya Nash, who helped the family entering the United States. I look back and I realize that it's an incredible history that we have to preserve. Today, Lily has taken over the position her mother once held, that of informing the deaf community about Nazi persecution from a deaf perspective. Nellie and Lily grew up to marry deaf men and have deaf and hearing Jewish children. This gave the world a great victory over Hitler and the Nazis' plan for an Aryan race. 
I hope this history will never be repeated.